This is CBC Here and Now. I make no mistake, I am well aware that busing was a mess. More buses, virtual learning, and nurses to help in schools. Education Minister Tom Osborne announces new details for the back to school plan. My family and I will be downloading the app and I encourage others, all of you in fact, to do the same. The COVID app is now available here. How does it work and how can it protect you? If you have outdoor plans for the long weekend, you are in luck. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. After weeks of backlash, the province has revamped its back to school plan, adding more buses and virtual classes. But the education minister says smaller class sizes are unrealistic and, and expensive. The CBC's Heather Gillis reports. Welcome to Waterford Valley High. In less than a week, students will flood hallways and school gymnasiums like this one. Today, Education Minister Tom Osborne gave details about how the school year will look, including an overhaul of the busing plan. Make no mistake, I am well aware that busing was a mess. He says about 100 more school buses will be on the road this year, costing 10 to $11 million. They're looking for more drivers as they try to notify parents quickly about busing eligibility. Uh, it's simply unacceptable to have a student uh, or a parent of a student be told uh, that they need to walk six or seven or ten kilometers. It is not acceptable. Osborne also announced at least 10 new virtual learning positions for children and families who are immunocompromised and unable to attend classes. And if the doctor determines that the student should not attend school for an extended period of time, accommodations will be provided. Accommodations for immunocompromised teachers will also be provided, like plexiglass shields. Student assistance hours will be increased to reduce their interaction with multiple classes, and there'll be five new public health nurse positions to provide COVID-19 support in schools. But when it comes to smaller class sizes that teachers and parents have been rallying for, Osborne says that would be expensive. We'd need upwards of $100 million for additional staff and educators, and we'd need about a billion dollars in infrastructure. Teachers call the details released today progress, though NLTA President Dean Ingram says he still has concerns. We're still in the position that our kindergarten through grade six students should be looking at mandatory mask wearing in line with other public venues. And we certainly feel that the measures, the preventive measures for other employees in the province need to be in place for our teachers and those who work in the education sector as well. Still, Osborne maintains school will be safe. Based on the advice of our chief medical officer of health, based on the fact we have no community prevalence and no community spread of COVID, that it is safe to have all students return to school for the start of the school year. He says if the situation with COVID changes, they'll be flexible and change the plan. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, a critic of the previous busing plan is now impressed with today's promises. Dave Callahan previously told Here and Now he was frustrated with the number of students who couldn't take the bus. Here and Now's Colleen Connors has his reaction tonight. First of all, very refreshing to see a new minister actually recognize the state by which the busing industry was in. I mean, previous to COVID, it was in a hard enough state. And now to respond with money and extra buses, I got to say it's refreshing uh, and it's encouraging. Callahan was frustrated with the old bus plan that left 6,000 students without a ride to school. Government is now promising a seat for every kid by the end of the month. I mean, if those kids that were finding themselves without transportation, those parents that were really searching their souls, how am I going to make this work? You know, single parents with no vehicle and no ability to get the child to school. It's got to be reassuring. The education minister calls the old busing plan a mess and says he was disappointed. Government says it's taking the next few weeks to purchase buses, some a year past expiring, within and outside the province. That's about 100 extra buses. Callahan hopes those extra rides mean fewer students on a bus at a time. I haven't heard a commitment to, to lowering the densities aboard of the buses. 
but I think with more busing, that probably with a bit more inventive thought put to routing and, and scheduling, that probably the numbers aboard the, the buses can be reduced. I think 46 is still too high. Once students are back to school safely, the government promised to do a deep dive into where things went wrong with the initial busing plan. In just a few days, students are going to be lining up, distanced of course, to board these buses. Now some students will have to wait a few extra weeks until those additional buses are added to the routes. Osborne did mention today in his announcement that they are looking for more qualified bus drivers and he put the call out to hire more drivers. Callahan says that might not be so easy. He says there is a shortage of qualified bus drivers in this province. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. The province is rolling out an app that's designed to alert you if you've been in contact with someone who has COVID-19. Newfoundland and Labrador is the second province to adopt it. Here and now, Peter Cowan joins us live. So, Peter, how does the app work? Carolyn, the app is free and it's pretty easy to install on your phone. The key thing here, though, is going to be getting enough people to install it to make it the most effective. My family and I will be downloading the app and I encourage others, all of you in fact, to do the same. Here's how it works. If you're closer than two meters with someone for more than 15 minutes, your phone uses Bluetooth to exchange a random key. It doesn't share location information or any personal details. If you later test positive, you're given a code to put into your phone. Your close contacts then receive an alert and they're provided with information to get tested. So far, figuring out who's been exposed in this province hasn't been a struggle. There's only one active case and no community transmission. So why roll out this app? It's for the future. Uh, there may come a time when we're not in the same situation, uh, the fortunate situation that we are right now. And in that, uh, in that case, this app will be useful and we'll have it in place. People will be familiar with it uh, for using it. Ontario is the only other province to roll out the app so far. Others are still considering it. Quebec has said it won't use it. To be most effective, it needs most people using it. That hasn't happened in Ontario, but this week health officials in Ottawa said one person there tested positive after being told through the app they'd been in contact with someone who had the disease. Fitzgerald is hoping people in higher risk environments in particular start using it. This app will be useful in those situations where there are larger crowds gathered together and uh, in, um, for example, uh, bars and nightclubs is one area where I see it being particularly useful and certainly uh, anyone who is um, heading to those areas, it may be um, worthwhile or it should be, would be worthwhile to download the app in that situation. But what about privacy? The Information and Privacy Commissioner was involved with the creation of the app. He's not only endorsing it, but using it himself. He says it's been thoroughly examined by him and his colleagues. It's been subject to a lot of scrutiny. And, uh, and we're confident that this app does not involve the collection of personal information uh, by uh, the government or by a company. Now, one thing with the app is it requires the latest version of the Apple operating system or Android device, so some older phones aren't going to work with it. But we did hear today that there is going to be some outreach for government to more vulnerable areas. They're going to work with the seniors advocate, for example, to try and encourage adoption of the app. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. That's Hearing Now's Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, a war of words is growing in the ferry captain's strike. Today, the provincial government pointed the finger at the captain's union, blaming them for the disruptions in service, and the union fired right back as travelers faced another day of delays. Hearing Now's Garrett Berry has more. A phrase we've heard so often in these types of contract disputes is, well, we don't want to negotiate in public. That appears to be well out the window in this particular dispute. Today, two government ministers called together reporters to tell them that the offer on the table is as good as it's going to get. Yeah, this is our offer. That's it as it this is our offer. We're not, you know, the province right now is not in a fiscal situation to, to move from that offer. You know, it's an offer that's in line with everybody else that would have received increases uh, in the public service uh, over the last eight years. So, yeah, this is our offer. It's a 5% raise. According to government, it's the same type of offer that other unions have seen and have accepted. Crocker is urging the Guild to reconsider and end this dispute. 
but the guild is objecting in part because the range is limited. It only goes back to the beginning of the year, not to 2018. The guild says that on this issue, they are being treated differently than everyone else. Caught between these two sides are the ferry users. As the strike has gone on, frustrations have mounted. Online groups are being flooded with complaints about people being left behind and who qualifies as essential traffic. The minister in charge is asking people to be reasonable. I'm hearing stories of someone waving an empty envelope saying I have a doctor's appointment. That person should be absolutely ashamed of herself to take the position of someone who definitely needed to get off the island or back on the island with their loved ones. There are other issues in this contract dispute besides pay. One of them is the daily sailing schedule. According to the government, the union wants that schedule set into the collective agreement itself, but the province doesn't want to do that. It says it would limit flexibility going forward. The union says it's only asking for what the ferry crew workers get and also says it's willing to go to independent arbitration to resolve the dispute. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Gander. The Dominion strike could keep growing. The union says it plans to expand demonstrations to more Loblaw brands in the province, including a few no-frills stores as well as the Shoppers Drug Mart chain. In a letter sent to workers this week, Loblaws told strikers it won't budge. In the letter, the Atlantic VP says competition is high, the population in Newfoundland and Labrador is low, and people simply have less money to spend. According to Mike Dusset, that's affecting the company's already thin profits. He says higher wages mean higher prices and customers will shop elsewhere. But Unifor says the company hasn't proven any of that. They make these claims about profitability, but we haven't seen any proof of that. We haven't seen it. We, in, in mostly in bargaining, we will be given financials to validate those kind of things. And, and frankly, the company came, gave a short speech at bargaining that they're losing money and losing market share and, uh, you know, populations declining in Newfoundland and, uh, and, and uh, but really there's nothing to back it up. Dominion workers went on the picket line nearly two weeks ago. They're pushing for higher wages and more full-time jobs. Well, the Labor Relations Board has come under intense scrutiny this week over an embarrassing privacy breach. And now CBC News has learned that big changes have been made to prevent further mistakes and to help restore trust to the union certification process. Terry Roberts reports. The Labor Relations Board says it's ready to accept responsibility for its mistake, that it will fully cooperate with an investigation by the Privacy Commissioner. And it will also carry out an internal review in the wake of a cringeworthy mistake. It sent digital copies of signed union cards like these to Grieg NL, the Marystown company at the center of a certification drive by the Carpenters Union. The mistake is a violation of the Labor Relations Act and has labor leaders in an uproar this week. This is a terrible example of what can go wrong and what has gone wrong. These cards are supposed to remain confidential with the board. The policy is meant to give comfort to workers that they will not face reprisals for wanting to unionize. But the Carpenters Union is alleging the company started laying off workers immediately after receiving the union cards and has now filed a complaint of unfair labor practices against Grieg NL. Well, it is of our opinion, once the Labor Board released the private information of the workers on site, shortly after workers were laid off, <clears throat> and, excuse me, and in our opinion, it was done due to the privacy breach of the Labour Board. These layoffs happened an hour to an hour and a half after the privacy breach, which leads us to believe the employer acted in bad faith and laid these workers off for signing union membership cards. Grieg NL has denied targeting workers who favoured unionising. Meanwhile, the board has not explained how the error occurred. But in a letter to unions and employers that was obtained by CBC, Labour Board Chairman David Conway acknowledges that the breach of privacy has damaged the board's reputation. He said the board and its staff are firmly committed to maintaining the integrity of the board's processes and the integrity of the very important role that the board has within our province. The board is now trying to repair its image and has made procedural changes to protect confidential information such as union cards. For example, the board will no longer accept union information in digital form. Paper copies of union cards will be reviewed and then sealed and only accessed with written authority from the applicable union. As part of its review, the Labour Board will also assess whether it should hire more staff, 
Meanwhile, there are now two unions vying to represent workers at the Marystown construction site. So there appears to be no end in sight to all this labor turmoil. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Paradise. Well, Premier Andrew Fury has put Moya Green in charge of the province's new economic recovery unit. Born in St. John's, Green's career led her to top jobs at both Canada Post and the UK's postal service, the Royal Mail. She was the first woman and the first non-British person to run the Royal Mail, which she privatized. She retired from that post in 2018. Creating an economic recovery team was one of Fury's major campaign platforms during the Liberal leadership run. She won't be paid, but will have her expenses covered. Ecstatic uh, that uh, Dame Green has accepted this appointment. Um, and we'll work with her to uh, put together a team uh, of advisors that will develop short, medium, and long term strategies uh, uh, to help with the economic and fiscal capacity of the province. Mm -hmm. She's got a history of privatizing Royal Mail. What assets are on the table here that you may look to do something similar with? No, I mean, that's not why we picked her. We picked her because, she, because of her organizational skills. And if you look at the change management skills that she brings to the table, I can't think of another Canadian who's had more change management skills than, than, uh, than Dame Green. Um, everything needs to be looked at. It'd be irresponsible for me as Premier to say that we're taking things off the table before we even know what the potential value is. Well, meanwhile, NDP leader Allison Coffin is raising some concerns over Green's appointment. First, she wants to know what role the Independent Appointments Commission played in appointing Green to the job. And Coffin is worried Green's appointment is a sign that cuts are coming since Green has been known for privatizing services in her previous roles. Well, in other news, a St. John's company wants to recycle those old expired pills sitting inside your medicine cabinet. Not only can they extract the active ingredient in the medication, they can also reuse that drug. Here and now, Cease Hair explains. Blaine Edwards' company is called Unbound Chemicals. It's a startup that runs out of Munn's Genesis Center. They've developed a process that removes the drugs inside expired prescription pills, potentially giving them a second life. A few weeks ago, we were able to successfully extract uh, the active ingredient from trimpamine, which is an antidepressant drug, uh, and we achieved 99.98% .98 purity, and the APIs were also stable enough for reuse. Considering the number of pills that are tossed in toilets, landfills, or incinerated in Canada and around the world, for Edwards, the waste management opportunity is huge. And those forgotten drugs still have value. It could mean one day recycling them to manufacture new pills, though Edwards says that's still a ways off. In the short term, he's looking at the $4 billion North American research market. There's other ways that active ingredients are used other than putting them in new pills. They're done for laboratory-based research, and they're also used in the manufacturing sector to test run the fabrication of pills. Pills expire when the non-medicinal ingredient or additive inside them breaks down. The actual drug itself, the active ingredient, remains intact much longer. Edward says globally about a third of all manufactured pills aren't used for various reasons. The big umbrella term is called medical non-compliance, but that's just a, a catch-all word for the many political, economic and social reasons why people don't finish medications. Can't afford it, don't like the side effects, it didn't work, doctor gave me a new prescription. Unbound Chemicals reached the extraction milestone in a chemistry lab at Memorial University. And Edwards says while they are just at the milligram level of research now, the objective is to recycle hundreds of thousands of kilograms of drugs. So there's still a long way to go. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it was a beautiful day for most of eastern Newfoundland. However, there was lots of rain for other parts of the province. That's generally going to continue as we head through the next day or so. But things are looking up as we head towards the weekend. So I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up.
Ashley joins us now from beautiful St. John's Harbor. Another lovely, lovely evening out there. Lots of sunshine. Looks a little bit breezy. It's a little bit breezy, but uh, beautiful in this sun today for sure. Let's take a look at those temperatures right across the board. It uh, doesn't get any better than this, I don't think. 20 degrees was the afternoon high so far in St. John's, 22 in Badger, 21 in Cornerbrook. Then we've got those temperatures in the teens again. Uh, high teens up through Labrador and Nain sitting at 19 degrees this afternoon. So taking a look at the current satellite and radar, that ridge of high pressure kind of holding on in the east. That's why we're seeing all of this sunshine, but we do have a cold front that's sweeping through. That's what's bringing those showers to southeastern portions of Labrador as well as the west coast and heading towards or headed towards central earlier this afternoon. Now the cloud cover will be on the increase in the east tonight, although it does look like it's should stay dry. Just some scattered showers, periods of rain along the south coast tonight and then uh, pretty quiet up through Labrador through the day but we will or through the night tonight rather we'll see some more periods of rain move in as we head towards the early morning hours. The winds will stay a little breezy tonight 30 to 40 kilometer per hour winds out of the south for the island but look how beautiful the temperatures will be tonight. Not really uh, seeing too much of a drop 15 to 17 degrees is the overnight lows. A little cooler for the big land around 11 to 13 degrees but again your winds will be easing and just a chance of a, a few showers for areas in the west and then tomorrow as uh, we start to see a little bit more rain move in cloud cover for sure periods of rain expected through the afternoon for southeastern portions of Labrador as well as the west towards the interior chance of a few showers through central and uh, again staying dry for eastern areas of the island including the Avalon more than likely lots of sunshine in play tomorrow up through the big land you're looking at a mix of sun and cloud with the chance or some cloudy periods rather with the chance of some showers moving in again and you'll see it'll stay pretty unsettled as we head into the early morning hours on saturday as well here's those temperatures even a degree or two warmer than what we're seeing today however those winds will pick up again tomorrow 50 to 60 kilometer per hour uh, gusts expected out of the south and it will feel a little bit more humid again tomorrow Temperatures will be a little cooler up through Nain, only reaching high near 13 degrees, 13 for Lab City as well. But uh, 22 degrees is the story for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And as we head into Saturday, it is looking like the rain will finally make its way towards the Avalon as we see some periods of rain move through. But in behind that, beautiful clearing skies. And that's because a ridge of high pressure is setting up again and will dominate as we head through the day on Sunday and even looking ahead, uh, dominating for a few days. However, it does look like we'll see some fog developing uh, along the southern portion of the island uh, into Sunday. Here's the temperatures again, anywhere from 20 to 24 degrees. So once we uh, see those showers in the first half of the day for most of the island, you should see some clearing skies, 19 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then uh, hanging on to some of that cooler air though for Lab City with the potential for some showers right through Saturday, 10 degrees. Same thing through Sunday, although you'll see a little bit more cloud cover, but take a look at uh, what's expected for Sunday for the island. Temperatures beautiful, 18 to 21 degrees with plenty of sunshine in play. And here's the long range forecast, certainly a forecast I like to give out. Lots of sunshine right through Monday and Tuesday as we see that ridge of high pressure set up. Temperatures flirting with the 18 to 20 degree mark. Overnight lows, not too bad either. Uh, 10 to 12 degrees. That's the story through central and western Newfoundland as well. Even a, a few degrees warmer for your daytime highs. However, central Newfoundland, those areas in those lower lying or lower lying areas rather will see temperatures dipping just a little bit cooler. But otherwise, it is looking like a spectacular long weekend in September. Uh, Eastern Labrador, you're looking at temperatures around 18 degrees for your long weekend on Monday. And then Tuesday, things get a little bit more unsettled with some showers. However, those temperatures staying up, but it is about 10 to 13 degrees for areas in Western Labrador wanted to share this beautiful shot. Look at the summer view in Tours Cove. Catherine sent us this. This photo is actually taken from her front porch. What a gorgeous shot and a gorgeous view. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And if you have any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca.
Thanks so much, Ashley. Well, a grandfather from Shashashi is making a grand gesture. Sebastian Benouin is walking 330 kilometers to send his grandson to a private boarding school in Ontario. Benouin hasn't been able to work during the pandemic, but says he'll do whatever he can to send Arius to the Canadian International Hockey Academy. The cost, about $50,000. The pair is walking from Churchill Falls to their hometown of Shashashi in the hopes of raising the money needed. So far, they've raised almost $17,000. Our colleagues at Labrador Morning caught up with them. Hi. Hi, I thought you were walking, but you're running. Well, sometimes I'm walking, sometimes I'm running, you know. I've been running for what, three hours almost now. Wow. Yeah. So how's it going? Oh, going good, going really good. But first night was really, really hard. First two nights was really hard. Why yeah. so? Yeah. Why? Because my legs are sore, feet are sore, the whole body sore. So quiet, peaceful, fresh air, really nice. Does that lift your spirit up? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I had to take a break 10 minutes and start running again. Minister Osborne made it quite clear that we're not going to get those smaller class sizes. The fact that they will need a doctor's note at this time of year, most doctors, including my doctor, are booking about two weeks from the, the current day. A new back to school plan, it includes extra buses and online alternatives as parent and teacher weigh in on what works and what won't.
Well, as you heard earlier, the provincial government announced some new measures in its back to school plan that it hopes addresses some of the concerns of teachers and parents. One of the biggest concerns was transportation. And today, government announced that they secured more buses so that every student who's eligible for transportation will receive it. There will be new virtual teaching positions created so students who are immunocompromised can learn from home. There will also be more student assistance and and public health nurses. Now, some teachers and parents held a rally on the steps of Confederation Building on Tuesday. Two of those protesters join me now. Catherine Stone is a parent of two in Bay Roberts, and Jillian Reed is a grade one teacher in Spaniards Bay. So, Ms. Stone, let's start with you. What did you make of the announcements today? The government took, made some steps in the right direction. Definitely. Um, the option for online learning for immunocompromised students um, is an excellent announcement. There are a lot of people who really need that option. Um, so I appreciate the steps that they're making in um, trying, you know, to uh, to provide a safe return to school. And what about you, Ms. Reed? Uh, what stood out for you today? One thing for sure that I'm a bit upset about is that even though they've been offered online learning, um, it is going to be requiring a doctor's note proving that the student is immunocompromised. It's not just uh, about uh, having a lower immune system that makes you more at risk of COVID. There are other factors. And the fact that they will need a doctor's note at this time of year, just like the busing situation, that the school will be going for a month before some students will be allowed to uh, attend school because there's no bus for them. Uh, the same will happen with these students that require a doctor's note. Uh, most doctors, including my doctor, are booking about two weeks uh, from, from the, the current day. And Ms. Stone, many parents and teachers have been calling for smaller class sizes. What did you think when the minister said that's just not realistic? Minister Osborne made it quite clear that we're not going to get those smaller class sizes, um, but that for me, Physical and social distancing is such an important part of uh, curbing the spread of COVID-19 in our schools. There's a financial strain behind all of this. I understand that completely. I'm a business owner. I understand what it takes to implement these measures um, within your building. So that's not lost on me. Um, but in my opinion, safety is the number one issue. And we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, and I know our prevalence is low and we are so lucky for that, but that doesn't mean that that won't change at any time. And I prefer that we were um, proactive and prepared for that with smaller class sizes from the get go, as opposed to trying to react to that later uh, should an outbreak occur. And Ms. Reed, how did you feel about what the minister said about class sizes? I'm pretty angry and I was pretty worried to do this interview because I do uh, feel like I'm afraid I won't. Uh, get my message across the way I would like it to be. Um, he said when it comes to classroom sizes that we need to be realistic. He also said that even if we had a billion dollars, would it make sense to spend it when there's no community prevalence? So this really shows us that the Minister of Education does not understand that uh, smaller classroom sizes is pivotal to education. You went back to work yesterday. We can see you're in the classroom right now. How did you feel when you walked back into the school and visualized how things are going to look next week? It was hard to come back to a year that there was a lot of emotions. It was our first day back in the building. It was, we still are having closure over the year we lost. Um, I'm missing those students. I wonder how they're doing um, and then just the amount of uncertainty that is provided to us, the lack of a plan to ha of ha on the ground floor of how we are going to run things, and the fact that things that the government has said is, are put in place are not yet put in place, um, it does uh, it makes me feel very overwhelmed. So tell me how you are feeling about sending your children back to school. I think I'm feeling the same way that many, many other parents are feeling. We're apprehensive, we're anxious, um, we're worried, um, you know, and we just have to try to move through it the best that we can. 
Well, Catherine Stone and Jillian Reed, thank you so much for speaking with us today and good luck next week. Thank you for having me. Thank you, have a good day. An incredible story now out of Beirut. It's been 30 days since a massive blast at the port left buildings in nearby residential areas in ruins. But late today, a recovery team worker said a rescue dog signaled it had detected signs of life somewhere deep in the rubble. A rescue team began setting up floodlights as the sun set. Team members say a cadaver dog had detected a body there yesterday. Temperature sen sensors used today prompted them to bring in the rescue dog, which picked up signs of breathing and a pulse. A rescue, if there is anyone alive, would still take hours. About 190 people are known to have been killed in the blast on August 4th. 6,000 were injured. 
Well, here at home, the CRA says the Canada Emergency Response benefits will be deposited before the weekend. Many people say their payments didn't arrive this week as expected. Serb claimants who applied for the monthly benefit on Monday were expecting the deposit in just a few days. As had been the case these past few months, they rely on the $2,000 to cover things like rent, food and other bills. Well, a former top Canadian diplomat is facing a sexual harassment lawsuit. CBC News has obtained court documents detailing allegations against Gordon Campbell dating back to his time as Canadian High Commissioner to Britain. The claims against Campbell, who is also a former Premier of British Columbia, have not been tested in court and CBC cannot independently verify them. Dominic Valaitis has the details. This is a new civil lawsuit filed in a London court in February of this year. The complainant, Judith Prins, worked at the High Commission of Canada in London back in 2013. At the time, Gordon Campbell was, of course, Canada's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Now, CBC News has seen details of this new civil lawsuit in which Campbell and the Government of Canada are named as defendants. And in it, Prins alleges she was inappropriately touched by Campbell on two occasions. These are not new allegations, but she also claims that when she was hired, she was told by a manager at the High Commission that she, quote, should be careful around Campbell, unquote. And that, she claims, led her to believe he has a predisposition to sexually harass women. Now, a settlement agreement over the two alleged incidents of inappropriate touching was reached in 2014. CBC News recently caught up with Gordon Campbell, and here's what he had to say about the new lawsuit filed against him. Allegations were made and uh, fully reviewed by the government, and uh, they were settled to all parties' satisfaction. So uh, if there's more to discuss, I'll have to talk to uh, uh, my counsel to see what uh, the next steps are. Do you intend to fight this? Would it be easier to settle perhaps? I think it's about easier for me to discuss this with my lawyer. Uh, this has been settled once before, more than five years ago now, and I think that uh, it's important for this to move properly through whatever channels that she decides. We have reached out to the complainant, Judith Prins. She lives here in England, but she declined to be interviewed as legal proceedings were now underway. But we know from the new court documents that she is seeking around $40,000 in damages for loss of income and for stress and anxiety caused. Judith Prince's lawyer is also arguing that the original settlement agreement struck in 2014 should now be overturned on the grounds she was unable to afford a lawyer at the time and had no alternative other than to sign that agreement. Dominic Valaitis, CBC News, Bristol. Well, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden traveled to Kenosha, Wisconsin today in the aftermath of the police shooting of Jacob Blake. I think we've reached an inflection point in American history. I honest to God believe we have an enormous opportunity. Now that the, the screen, the, the, the curtain's been pulled back, and just what's going on in the country, to do a lot of really positive things. Biden met with Blake's family members. The city has seen violent protests in the 11 days since police shot Blake in the back. U.S. President Donald Trump traveled to Kenosha two days ago. He said he passed on the chance to meet the Blake family after they requested to have lawyers present. Wisconsin is expected to be a key battleground state in November's presidential election. Well, a new treatment for seriously ill COVID-19 patients is being endorsed by the World Health Organization. Clinical trials show the use of two types of steroids may reduce deaths of patients in intensive care. The drugs are inexpensive and widely available, which are big pluses for a medical system that's bracing for a second wave. CBC's Vicodopia reports. 
For COVID-19 patients in intensive care, as many as 40% won't survive. But treatment with corticosteroids could change those odds, according to new research. This is far and away the largest effect that we've ever seen in a population of sick patients. Marshall's team reviewed seven new major clinical trials involving different intravenous corticosteroids. The results for every 25 patients in the ICU treated with either dexamethasone or hydrocortisone, deaths fell from 10 to 8. In theory of the nearly 860,000 COVID deaths worldwide, more than 170,000 people may have been saved with corticosteroids. So it's a robust kind of effect. It's a drug that we know very well and its safety profile is well established and it's inexpensive and quite broadly available. Excitement about the possibilities of corticosteroids began in June when an Oxford study published promising results for critically ill patients. Then some hospitals began using corticosteroids right away before this latest research was even published. I think that this data um, cements that decision and um, my, my expectation is that it's essentially the standard of care in Canada. The WHO initially warned against using corticosteroids because they were ineffective for SARS and potentially harmful. This latest research still doesn't explain how the steroids help patients with COVID-19 recover, though there are theories. The later phase of this disease is dominated by an inflammatory component and hyperinflammation. And I think steroids uh, are very good at decreasing that inflammatory component. The WHO warns taking corticosteroids won't protect people from getting COVID-19. Still, they're invaluable as hospitals prepare for the second wave of the pandemic. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Well, around the world, thousands are reporting lingering breathlessness, fatigue, memory loss and muscle pain long after contracting COVID. It's now, you know, over five months, five and a half months later, and I still feel really pretty unwell, both physically and cognitively. This 49-year-old British University professor was diagnosed with a mild case of the virus back in March. Thousands like her are still struggling, fearful of potential long-term damage to lungs and the brain. A symptom tracking app from King's College in London found one in 10 people who contracted the illness remain unwell three weeks after recovery. One out of every 20 people continue to report symptoms months later. Now to some sports news. Canadian basketball legend Steve Nash is the NBA's newest coach. He has just signed a four-year deal with the Brooklyn Nets. Nash played in the league for 18 seasons. He was a point guard with the Phoenix Suns, the Dallas Mavericks, and the LA Lakers. He was named the league's most valuable player in 2005 and 2006. He's also in the NBA Hall of Fame. Nash has spent the past five seasons as a player development consultant with the Golden State Warriors. This is his first coaching job.
Ashley is back with your weather recap. So how are things looking in the next 24 hours? Well, we're looking at things staying unsettled with some periods of rain moving in for areas in the west again tomorrow. These winds, just like now, are going to stay up tomorrow out of the south around 50 to as much as uh, 60 kilometers per hour. But the temperatures are going to be a little bit warmer, a degree or two from what we're seeing today, along with uh, some more humidity. Eastern areas looking at another beautiful day. You might see a little bit more cloud cover than what we're seeing today, but overall it's looking like a beautiful afternoon. Excellent. Thanks, Ashley. Well, this next story is about a man who is definitely not letting age slow him down. He's in his late 80s and is tackling heights that would make many other people say no way. For his birthday, the PEI man hit a high ropes course in Cornwall. Have a look. <laughs> So my grandfather is 87. He's been a really special part of my life, a really important man to me. Um, growing up, he started skiing. He was 60 at the time and I was eight. And he came out with me and my sister on the ski hill and we've been going every year ever since and taking some annual ski trips. At, when he was 85, we decided to take him to Rise and Climb Adventure Course because he's a bit of a daredevil. Ready for it? And he loved it so much, so we came back for his 87th birthday. Oh, first time here with the girls, yes, they took me over here. And I looked and said, oh, what's this? So looked interesting, so we thought we'd try it. And it's great fun. Everyone should try it. This is a Rise and Climb uh, adventure course, and we've been open now. This is our eighth summer. This is known as an aerial adventure park or a high ropes course uh, for ages usually nine and up to uh, 87 maybe. <laughs> so we've got three different levels at three different heights and each level has a series of obstacle courses that people can climb across. We generally have um, from six to maybe the 50 year old kind of range would sort of be our normal max. Yeah, not 87. We do kind of worry about him a bit, but he just, he never slows down and he doesn't like us to tell him to slow down either. It's just that he has no fear and he just stays active. He never stops and I think that's why he's so healthy is because he's just, he's in such good shape. This little one here, one day she had me come in and do some work on her in the dresser in her room. So anyway, I fixed it and then all of a sudden she said, can you build me a rock wall? So anyway. We decided, well, we could build a rock wall, didn't we? So then all of a sudden, a zip line, mm -hmm. and a rope climb. And agreed, her mother agreed to have everything. So we done it out there, built things, hauled it up there, and put everything together in our backyard. And now we get a 100 foot zip line, and, and a 12 foot rock wall, and a rope climb, and great there. And they just go down that, just flying. I got a little excitement. Wow, 87 years old. What a brave soul. Well, if you don't like heights, I'm sorry to say this next story takes us even higher. Illusionist David Blaine has burst back onto the scene with his first live stunt in years. Good to go. Good to go. Love you. <laughs> That's going to take me up. And there he goes into the Arizona sky yesterday. Blaine's latest stunt had him hanging from 52 giant balloons soaring more than seven kilometers in the air. He had an oxygen mask for when he reached 29,000 feet. And for context, that's where most commercial airliners fly. Wow. Well, that's it for this edition of Here and Now. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night.